So, what we do in my dojo is we never stand so square on the front of somebody. So you can see if somebody sets up because. in an offensive position, we always try and move offline. Okay? So, if we think of my partner, or uh, in this instance, uh, standing in the centre of a big clock. So, if you think of a big circle, and you stand in the centre of the circle. So, rather than standing with him facing me at 6 o'clock and me standing at 6 o'clock, what I'm going to do is I'm going to move offline. And we see this in a, to an extent when we see the opening movements of a kappa. Because we start in this position and we turn into this position. That doesn't actually mean we have to turn to 90 degrees to perform the technique. It just means we need to change our position. So if I'm here, I need to be somewhere else. Okay? So the kappa gives us that. So what we're going to see here is that this is the most immediate threat, isn't it? Why is that? Give somebody else a chance. <laughs> okay? Yeah, so because it's closest. So there's no point in me really worrying about that just yet if this can do some damage here. That, again, that makes sense? Yeah. So what I want to do is, oh, we're going to move out flying here. Okay? So first thing I want to do is as I come in, I'm going to move out and I'm going to cover. So you notice how we're starting to look at the opening movement of the cat. Notice also that when I move in, I'm not intercepting the wrist. Why might that be a problem? Somebody other than Alistair. <laughs> okay. Okay. Any ideas? Well, the yeah, absolutely. Exactly what I was looking for. Thank you. Uh, we have to think of the line of the threat. That's the first threat. It's nearest. That's negated. That becomes the next immediate threat. It's the nearest. And then if that's negated, we start to think about what else is available. Okay? So when I come from here, what I'm trying to do is cover around that elbow line. So what we see in the cat is if I come in and I'm here, what can I do to stop that elbow being a threat? Somebody else now. Push away. <laughs> <laughs> okay? What might I do? You block um, the elbow with your hand. Brilliant. Absolutely, spot on. They can't, from here, that's, that's what will happen. Okay? And when we see movements in kata, where we bring these hands around, this is the sort of thing it's doing. It's acting like a, a, what they sometimes refer to as more shuki, a circular block. So it actually gives me that opening. Okay? So that means I'm in a nice, strong position. Uh, now, think being with Nekoashi, you still have to push your weight forwards. Because if my weight's sitting in my back leg, that's what it's going to take me. It's going to take my balance. So I want to make sure in here, I actually want to be pressing forwards. Okay, so if he pushes into me here now, it's actually got something that I can do in response to his press. Yeah? Press. Do ask questions. Don't have to ask questions, but if you have any questions, <laughs> do ask them. Okay? So we go up here, well, from this position and from here, we've got our cover. Yep. So that's the first thing we're going to do. We're going to, we're going to move off outside that. So from our point of view, it doesn't actually matter at the moment whether I act before Adam's hand comes towards me, okay, or as it comes towards me, okay, because a straight line is a straight line. So he could be uh, punching, pushing, or grabbing, couldn't he? Still a straight line. So we only have to worry about that one pathway at the moment, but I'm negating that from here. Yes? Yes. Okay. So we're going to partner up and we're just going to try that initially. Yes? The moves will be subtly different depending on the demands that are placed upon you. Okay? So we've got a few options. Don't worry about again from here. So we come up from here, from this position. If I'm just doing this, if I had the, the typical shape of the kata, which is a 90 degree angle at the elbow, we've got the hand standing straight up, that's actually not necessarily my best position. Okay? Um, for a number of reasons. First of all, structure it's 90 degrees is quite weak. Generally, we need to be slightly over that 90 degree angle to keep a strong line through the arm. Um, another thing is that actually there's too many spaces for that to slide. Okay? So if, if I'm here and that slides, he's traveling into my fist. Here, he's got a lot further to travel. Okay? So we need to make sure that that's a possibility. We also need to think about from this position is that I'm covering. Okay, so where we see this in the kata, we might also see this in the kata. And if you look at cross-referencing your art to other arts, you'll see a lot of uh, commonalities where people bring their hands 
up to cover, they bring the hand around the back of the head because this is a strong structure and it's very hard to break through that. So we've got that from, from here, but also what it does, it gives me a piercing weapon. The elbow can now actually attack and then you've got the, the chamber movement that we can move into next, okay? I'm still seeing occasionally people standing square on. Um, do try and get to the habit of moving because if uh, I'm working with somebody who's bigger than me uh, and they just drive forwards and I stand here, they've smothered my technique. There's not really a lot I can do. So by moving, what I do is I give myself really important space to move. So I'm in here. Now I've got a lot further to travel before. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> we're both still smiling. That's okay. Um, so he has a lot further to travel to get to me as a countermeasure. So what I've done is I've neutralised the threat of the lead on. I've actually put myself into a position where now Adam has to travel a lot further to try and deliver that strike. Okay, And in the meantime, you are going to be in a position to hit him with all sorts of other techniques. Okay, So that shift is really important. Think of that clock again. So if I'm standing at 6 o'clock here, what I'm actually going to do is going to move over to the 4 or 5 o'clock mark. Okay, I'm going to move all the way around to a 3, because don't forget, if I move, they're moving as well. They're not static, so I don't need to move very far to get to that 4 or 5 o'clock mark. Yes? The two bones are what we use to meet the technique. Okay? At the moment what's happening, a lot of people are using the single bone. So they're using the ulna to strike the arm. The thing is if we do this. this, once we make contact, that becomes a push. Yeah, so it's pretty much a dead technique. Also, what's going to be stronger? Meeting something with one bone or meeting something with two bones? Two. Two, yeah, absolutely. So that's what we want to try and do. So if I'm uh, going to borrow Adam again for a moment here, so I want to use the two bones, not the single bone, here. Okay? It's a stronger structure. Um, also, again, if I'm here, and if he's pushing back against me, that's a strong structure. If I turn into a single blade of that, my structure is weaker. Okay, so you can break through that. It doesn't mean if you think of every punch you do, every block you do, you roll. Yeah. So when we look at a technique, often people make the mistake of thinking that that if we're taking uh, knife hand as a technique, they're thinking, okay. That's the, the end of the technique. No, that's past the point of impact. That's spent, that's done, okay? So actually where we strike or where we intercept is that midway point. Uh, we could go into the strike continuum and power generation and all the rest of it, but that's a lot of stuff to cover. What we want to do is just know, okay, I want to use two bones, then I can turn into one. So I go from two to one, Again, okay, from here, We've got lots of options, okay? So we're going to come up from here, we're going to come up from here now, okay? And the reason we're going to do this is because we want them to collapse. That's the move, right? Yeah, okay? So now notice this hand stays up. Always keep your hands in a position where they can do two things, okay? Protect you and control the other person. Or strike, you know, if you talk about him. Uh, protection and control. So I go from here, my hand's in a position to apply straight away, isn't it? Also from here, it's in a nice strong position to drop into the arm here and I can attack the elbow joint. So we're going to come up, we're going to go one, two, here. Should we show that from the other side? Okay. Two, one, two. Okay. And as he goes forwards, we can take him out, we can walk him down, we can do all sorts of things. Okay, again? Please. Yes, okay. Here we go. One, two, three. I don't need to take the back foot out. <laughs> Elbow gone, no, laying down. You can always ask him to lay down. Okay, nicely, of course. Thank you. Right. Don't have to put them on the floor just yet. <laughs> no, sorry. So, you want to think of, uh, again, move to the outside. 
We're going to Harry and Carla strike, drop down into uh, the belt or just below the belt. We're going to hook and catch the arm here, and then we're going to apply a little bit of pressure, drop the shoulder forwards. And you can try that. Have a go. Your elbows are going too wide. And remember what we're doing with the movement. The elbows stay in. Pop from here. Look where my elbow is. People are trying to do this from here. It's not going to happen. Here. The big advantage is that we are running across the joint. Okay? Rather than trying to go parallel to it. We want to think about running across the joint, the angle of the joint. So therefore, I can actually put pressure on there quite easily. Another big advantage is that this is why we use a lot of forearm strikes. The length of the forearm is a lot longer than the, the width of your fist. So if you're going to hit something in motion, doesn't it make sense to use a, a, a bigger weapon? Yeah? Okay, right. From here. That's it. So this hand just hooks and catches. So I can... No, so don't, what I don't do is I try not to do this. I don't grab with the thumb. I just hook the hand. Why wouldn't I grab with the thumb? Why, why would I not do that? Any ideas? I'm not sure if it's actually true. They can like kind of pick your fingers off. Yeah, the, the thumb's very vulnerable from a position like that. So if we don't actually include the thumb in that position, it's going to be a lot stronger. Okay, so we just tend to hook catch here okay because if things go wrong and your hands like that it's not sorry you're gonna end up damaging your thumb you want to think of just walking it in just try and walk in front of the head <laughs> just just walk okay the good thing about walking where you can see is you know all the obstacles <laughs> the thing about walking where you can't see is you don't know where you're gonna fall over okay so you always need to know where you're gonna go and you always need to be able to see where you're gonna go in the dojo, it's sort of okay because we jump out of the way. So use that pot here. Okay? So look at Adam's posture. If I let him stand up, I'm in a bad position. So I need to have good posture, but I need to break my partner's posture. Okay? And if I break their posture and I break their balance, then they can't really be that effective. Okay? Good. So let's go back and just try that a couple more times on the way. So because we've only got about 10 minutes, rather than just stay with the same movement, let's look at another part of the kata. Okay? So we have um, this movement where we go from a, a spear hand through into a turn. Yeah? Okay. So for this, what we're going to do is maybe we've not been successful with this first bit of control uh, and they've come in to try and hit me with the other hand so I'm going to pop through from here and drag the arm across from here now we have our takedown okay so my knee comes down to control because I don't want him turning back into me I don't want him pulling me down onto him so my knee allows me to posture up Try to avoid dropping your knee onto them too heavily because obviously that's going to be really uncomfortable. But we want to think from, from here, we've got pop, bang through from here, boom. That's our movement. Yes? Again? So we look at the first bit then. Without doing the takedown, what we're going to do is this hand's covered, we've got a punch comes in, we've got a distraction, we're going to feed the arm across, that breaks posture. As he flies forwards, coming to this part of the movement here. That's what I want. Okay? This is a hand just above the belt to make him buckle. Otherwise, I'm going to be quite finding that quite difficult. If that's a successful shot, it will happen anyway. But if it hasn't been quite as successful as I'd like, I'm going to have to stick my thumb in there and then I'm going to turn around. Okay? Which is our nukatai spear hand <coughs> movement. Turn around. Uh, you're striking across the chest, not under the neck. I'm striking across the chest because I don't want to damage his neck. Okay, but so is I'm that doing it safe way? Okay, so is that? But 
you do that in training, but in the stream you'd actually hear them in the net. You do what you feel you need to do in, in a live situation, but I would say I would always advocate in this situation, uh, try to do the minimum amount of damage that you can in a situation. Not least of all, because if you seriously hurt somebody, there's going to be legal repercussions, and you need to be able to justify what you did. And if you said I actually tried to hit him across the chest, but my arm slid up and hit him across the neck, you know, at least you were trying to look out for the uh, safety of the same at that time. Okay? If we have a moral obligation to do minimum amount of damage, not maximum amount of damage, okay, we need to protect ourselves. But that doesn't mean we have carte blanche to do as much damage as we possibly can to the other person. All right? We do what we need to do to make sure that we're safe. But in the, at the same time, we have to minimise the amount of damage that we're doing. Do just enough. Okay? So I think Goldilocks, not too little, not too much, <laughs> just enough. Okay? So we're going to get that kind of hit pop down from here. It's already there. Okay? Yes, I could go up there, but actually, this is a nice solid shot anyway. Okay? And as I say, here now, that's really easy to do the rest of the movement. And that's just typically from the catheter. Yeah? So even here, you can see it's still from the cata. Yes. I come in, <coughs> attack the elbow on that turn. It's still passable, moving from the cata. Okay? Have a go. Uh, it is Yuki's responsibility to give as authentic an attack as they can. I'm going to throw a mean punch. I'm not going to hurt them, but I'm going to make it look and feel like it's real. Okay? So if I've got a cover here, you can punch. Boom! We're going to make it look real, like it's real, okay? But nobody was hurt in the making of this video. <laughs> <laughs> All right? Okay, so when you go back, think about why Adam tried to get to me with his front hand. That's not work. So what's going to happen next? Yeah, of course it is. So, and people seem to be struggling with the idea that actually if one hand comes at you, then the next one will. Here's something you want to remember. Punches come in bunches. Okay? So that means if this one's active, it won't take long for that other one to be active. So I don't have to wait for it. So it's not like waiting for a bus. Okay? I have to wait another 10 minutes for another one comes along. It's coming along straight away. Okay? Excellent. Thank you. So it's used in... Um, Old style karate, or they refer to Mio Todo, the idea of married hands. Okay? That means both hands have to be working to support the, the uh, desired outcome. Um, if they're not doing that, then one, one hand is redundant. You, you don't want to have redundant tools um, just sitting around doing nothing when they could be working. Okay? So if we see what happens from here, I've got this kind of turn from here. Miyoto, they married hands, one hand feeds through into the other hand, and then from here, pop, we're here, close in. So that's already jamming that arm up. Okay? So I've got this to the ground, look how controlled that arm is, all the way through the movement. Okay? Pop, or pop, but it's hooking and catching. Okay? That takes a little bit of practice, but actually, more often than not, what happens when we engage limbs, People get carried away and think they have to hold things. No, you just have to track things. Uh, if we take knife hand as an example, we can't from here, punch comes in, come in here. I'm not holding the arm with my hand, but I'm trapping it with my forearm. And this gives me a lot of scope to do other things. Where it's under, over, stays on the inside, and there's a functional space. Okay? So this is the same. When we do our takedown, we come from here, we go on top, we go on here. No, because they're off balance and you're, you're trapping the arm. It's a good question. But we, should we have a look at it again? And so, so when we come through it nice and slowly, come up through from here and come round into this position. And what I've done is I've come in, look how close my body is to. Okay, so, and he's off balance. So if he's trying to hit me with that elbow, there's no power. Yeah. Now I catch the arm again. Okay, really good question. I get some really good questions from you guys. I always have really good questions. <laughs>
Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, it's important when we train respect for uh, ourselves, respect for our partners, respect for the uh, techniques that we are practicing because potentially they're dangerous techniques. Uh, and uh, I saw a post the other day, somebody said uh, there's no such thing as a black, te black belt technique. I totally disagree. Every technique is a black belt technique. Every single one. From the day you first step foot in that dojo, you bow as you come onto the mat, that's a black belt technique. First time you do a block, that is a black belt technique. You may not be at a black belt level yet, but you're practicing black belt skills from day one. Okay? So treat the techniques with the respect they deserve. Treat yourself with the respect that you deserve. Treat your partners with the respect that they deserve. Okay? But if we think in terms of self-defense, self-defense is not the same as a match. A match, as we're saying, is irrespective of skill levels of the people participating, is actually from a, a, a neutral point. Okay? In self-defense, you always are always starting from a negative position. The other person intends to hurt you, you've got to try and stop that. Okay? You haven't entered into a consensual match situation. Therefore, they start with an advantage, you start from a disadvantage. So in our training, we have to train to turn that around. Once we've turned it around, we try and keep that advantage. Do you understand the difference between a match and self-defense? It's a big difference. The techniques can be very similar, but actually the mindset is a very different uh, animal. Okay? Good, so we're going to finish that there. Uh, feet together.